Shorty, I don't know how I missed you this morning, but hi. Well, we got that straightened out. It's good to see everybody that's here. Glad you're here. Amen. And happy, happy anniversary to you and your lovely wife. 66. Yeah. I don't know how she did it. <laughs> today we want to talk. Today we want to talk about keeping record. Do you keep records? Some people never throw anything away. Do you have any concert stubs from rock concerts back in the days when the Beatles were just a young group from Liverpool? Do you have any ticket stubs from basketball games from years ago when UK was really a ball team? <laughs> what a, my, my mother used to keep papers that I would bring home from school, from kindergarten on. If I brought it home, mommy kept... When I graduated from high school, she had boxes of papers that I had brought home from school. She never threw them away. This year, my beautiful wife went through the cabinet and threw away some papers that I think were pretty close, doctor's visits, that were pretty close to 20 years old. But some people keep everything. Everything. But you know, some things we do need to keep. I think tax records, you keep them, what, seven years? It's a good idea to keep your birth certificate. You never know when you might need it. It's a good idea to keep your marriage certificate. It's a good idea because, because lo and behold, you may need it. You may need it. It's a good idea to keep death certificates. I've learned that to be a fact. Keep those things because later on in life, things will pop up where you need proof of such a thing. And it's best to keep them. But I'll tell you what, there are some things that we don't need to keep. The Apostle Paul points out one of the things that we don't need to keep. And he brings it up in what is known as the love chapter of the Bible. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He writes that wonderful chapter to inform the Christians at Corinth that there's something better than miraculous gifts. Now, we're not, I'm not talking about miraculous gifts, but that was the purpose of chapter 13. He tells them that there was something better than miraculous gifts that some of the Christians at Corinth had been blessed with. Now, we know that there was a time in history of the early church when Christians, certain Christians, could perform certain miracles, like speaking in other languages without having ever studied those languages, being able to interpret other languages, having never studied those languages, being able to preach the very truth of God without having to gain that word through diligent study. Some people could do that. It was a gift given unto them for the church. Some could heal the sick. Why? Some could even raise the dead. 
The purpose of the Christians being able to perform these miracles was very specific. In fact, the Lord in Mark chapter 16 emphasized the purpose of miracles. Following his resurrection, he gave to his apostles what is known as the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world, he said, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And guess what? That's what the apostles did. They went out into the world and they preached the gospel of Christ, but they were not alone. Not in that quest of preaching the gospel. They had heavenly help. And here's how that heavenly help is described. Mark 16 and verse 20, the Bible says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. The Greek word, or the word signs, is the Greek word semeon. And it means miracles, or God's authentication. So some of the Christians at Corinth had the ability to perform certain miracles. That we know. And this was to prove to people who saw these miracles that the ones doing the speaking were indeed speaking words authorized by Almighty God. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 all deal with miracles. Chapter 12, Paul tells the church of Corinth what the miracles are. Chapter 14, he tells them how miracles are to be used whenever they were in use in the early church. And let's face it, there were problems with miracles in the early church at Corinth. Those who had them, I can do miracles. You can't. <laughs> I'm better than you. And that was the attitude that they had. And so Paul writes to them, he says in chapter 13, there's something better than miracles. Yeah. In chapter 13, he tells them that which is better than miracles is that little word called Love. Love. Now in chapter 13 towards the end, he tells how long those miracles were to last, and that is until that which is perfect has come, until we have the Word of God in its completed form, that it can confirm itself, prove itself, then there was a need for miracles. But once we have the Bible in the form that we have, there's no need for them. They're gone. No need. Well, he tells them that the thing that is superior to miracles is love. Not just any love, but agape love, God love, the ultimate love, the love that puts others first no matter what. Now, I've said all of that to say this. I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians 13.5. He's been talking about how love conducts itself. Here's what love does. Love's one of those words that if somebody comes to you, say your child comes and says, what's love? <laughs> well, that's a toughie, isn't it? The best way to describe what love is is to describe what love does. What love does. And so Paul begins and he tells them, he explains to them what love does and what love doesn't do in 1 Corinthians 13. And he says in verse 5, Love doth not behave itself unseemly. Now he uses the word charity. But charity is love, agape love. Love does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh, no evil. Now in particular, I want us to notice, he says that love thinketh no evil. The word thinketh there is the Greek word logizomai, and it means to reckon or take 
into account. What, Paul, are you saying? Paul says that one of the things that love does not do is love does not record and keep wrongs. You ever been wronged? Amen. Yeah, who hasn't? We've all been wronged. Amen. So what do we do? We sit back and figure out how we're going to get them back. No, Paul says love doesn't take into account what's been done to it. We don't keep record of that which has been done to us which is wrong. But a lot of folks keep record of wrongs that were performed to them and then keep those records, like Grandma used to keep things, for 90 years. These records need to be cleaned out of our psyche immediately. How can you love somebody when you're harboring memories of things that that person may have done to you? Jesus said when He taught His apostles how to pray, He said that if we don't forgive others, the Heavenly Father is not going to forgive us. Well, so you see there are some records that we don't need to keep, period. We need to get rid of them things. But there are some records that we do need to keep and we should be glad we have. One of them is called the Bible. The Bible is a record given to us by inspiration from the very mind of God so that we creatures made in His image can turn to its pages and find answers to many of the questions that we have. Where did man come from? Bible tells us. Where did marriage come from? Bible tells us. Where did sin come from? What is sin? What's the punishment for sin? The Bible tells us. What's the cure for sin? The Bible tells us. We read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, whenever we look into the Holy Writ, whenever we look into the Word of God, we know that we're reading that which came from the very mind of God and was given for our learning. Peter points this same thing out in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, where he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This isn't a hard verse. This is an easy verse to understand. When Peter says that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation what he means there is he's saying that the Old Testament prophets who wrote those precious words that you and I today can sit down and open up and read, they did not write of their own personal explanation about things. But rather, the prophecy originated, as the next verse says, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Ghost. Isn't that something? We have in our possession today, on our coffee tables at home, in our pockets, in our suits, that which has come down through the ages from the very mind of God to us. Isn't it great we got that record? A record of the love of God for His creation, man. And this is a record that we should keep in our hearts and keep in our minds. Next Sunday is the day that the world will celebrate as the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Easter. The word Easter is found how many times in the Bible? One time. One time, Acts 12, 4. Herod the king had had James, the brother of John, one of the sons of Zebedee, one of the men who was known, Jesus referred to him as the sons of thunder. Remember they wanted to call fire down from heaven and destroy the people of Samaria when the people of Samaria would not accept Jesus. And so Jesus called James and John sons of thunder. Of course, He didn't let them do that. 
Christ was opposed to such things. But Herod the king had that James, the brother of John, arrested and put to death, and the Jews were pleased over this. And so Herod thought, well, if that pleased the Jews, I'm going to tickle them to death. And he had Peter arrested. And he had Peter put in prison. And the Bible tells us that here is what he had in mind in Acts 12, 4. And when he, Herod, had apprehended him, Peter. When Herod had Peter arrested, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. Now, a quaternion was four soldiers, so Peter was under guard by 16 soldiers all at one time. And they were there to keep him. And then the Bible says that Herod had it in mind, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, we know that God, God had plans for Peter. He wasn't done with him. So God did not let Herod have Peter put to death. God had him miraculously released from prison. But what I want us to do is I, I just simply want us to look at the word Easter here. The word Easter in the original language is the word Pascha. Christ has been referred to as the Paschal or Paschal Lamb. The word Pascha come, means Passover. So it was kind of a, a misuse of the language. But anyway, that's the only time that the word Easter is found there. But anyway, Herod decided that after the Jewish Passover, he was going to have Peter put to death. But like I said, God didn't want Peter put to death yet. He had more for Peter to do. But still, next Sunday, the world will celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Christ. Let me suggest to you that we keep record of this event ourselves and of that which led to this event. And we keep that record every Sunday. Every first day of the week. It's known as communion, or we call it the Lord's Supper. It was on the day prior to the crucifixion of Christ that our Lord instituted this wonderful memorial. He takes bread, unleavened bread. How do we know it was unleavened? Well, it was a Passover, and during the Passover, the Jews were not permitted to eat leavened bread. They couldn't even have leavening in their homes. So the bread at that occasion, whenever Jesus was eating with his apostles, that bread was an unleavened bread. No doubt. Absolute unleavened. He breaks it and he gives it to his apostles. Eleven of them, because Judas is already gone, out to do that which he was going to do. And Jesus tells them to eat it for it is His body, or it represents His body. He takes the cup, and He gives it to the apostles. He tells them to drink of it. He says, this is My blood. This represents My blood. And then He tells them that He will drink of it with them in the kingdom, in the church. That which was yet to come. Now I want us to note something here. Everything we do by way, by way of worship, we do it because of command or example or inference. Inference. Everything we do by worship, we must also make sure that any command, example, or inference of such is found in the correct dispensation of time. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. There's been three dispensations of time, correct? There was the patriarchal age. That was the age when God spoke to the people through the fathers. There's where the word patriarchal came, comes from. God spoke to the people and gave His laws through the fathers. People like Adam and Abraham and all the way to Noah. These were all patriarchs. Isaac and Jacob and so forth. God gave a law during that time. Genesis chapter 18. He gave a law concerning circumcision. Your male child shall be circumcised on the 
eighth day. That was the law that God gave. Does that apply to us today? No, oh, doesn't. It was given under the patriarchal age. Therefore, it applied to people under that age. Now, it was carried into the Mosaic age. So it became a law there too. The patriarchal age, you can read about it in the book of Genesis. Beginning at Exodus, and let me suggest to you that it goes all the way through John. Because the church don't start till the book of Acts. So we go all the way through John, and we find people living under what was known as the Mosaic dispensation, when God had given the law through Moses to the people. Through the fathers to the people, through Moses to the people. There were certain laws under the Mosaic age. Some of them had to do with the Sabbath day. Sabbath means rest. That's what the word Sabbath means, rest. It was the seventh day of the week, so that means it was our Saturday. That was the day of worship under the Mosaic dispensation of time. There were laws of the Sabbath. On Saturday, no cooking. If you cooked, you violated the Sabbath. You couldn't travel any more than a Sabbath day's journey from home, seven-tenths of a mile or 3,100 feet. That was the law. You could not violate that law. Jesus kept the Passover with His apostles and washed their feet. Under what dispensation? That was under the Mosaic dispensation of time. If you had a son, and that son was not being controlled by you, according to the law, under the Mosaic dispensation, what were you to do with that son? He was to be taken outside the city walls and stoned to death. That was under... Are we under those laws today? No, because that was the Mosaic dispensation of time. And the laws there had been given through Moses to the people. Aren't you glad you didn't live under the Mosaic dispensation of time? <laughs> we today live under the Christian dispensation. The law was given by God through the fathers during the patriarchal. By God through Moses during the Mosaic, but by God through Christ during the Christian, and we are under the Christian dispensation of time. And we find the communion being practiced by command and by example under the Christian dispensation of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. These passages tell about this wonderful, wonderful memorial. Since the early church partook of the communion on the first day of the week, then we too today observe, continue to observe this memorial. Every Sunday we keep record of the death of our Lord, His resurrection, inasmuch as we do this until He comes again. In other words, as long as the church worships here upon the earth, we are to observe this memorial. Well, finally, let me suggest to everybody here that when it comes to keeping records, God does too. God keeps records. And we all need to desire to be in the record that God keeps. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 11, 12, and 15, we read these words. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in those books 
according to, those, to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want my name written in the book of life. Don't you? How can I get it there? In Acts chapter 2, we find the beginning of the church. We find the, the Apostle Peter telling folks there in Acts 2.38 to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. On that wonderful day, there were about 3,000 people who became Christians by being baptized. And notice that we read in Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, or those who were being saved. How were they being saved? By repenting of their sins and being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When one is saved, his name is written in the book of life. With that one's name in that great book, eternity, eternity will be lost. Lost. God is keeping record. Get ready for that great day of judgment by making sure that your name is recorded by our Creator in the book of life. Today be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you're here as an erring child of God, don't leave this building unprepared. The invitation is yours. Please, won't you come? Won't you respond to it while together we stand and while we sing? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Still the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you. 